I talk a lot about my my years playing baseball. Went on to play college ball, and it was a big highlight um, to that season of my life. What I don't talk a lot about um, in high school was my basketball career. I played two years of high school basketball my junior and senior year. Uh, we went defeated two years in a row. I want you to notice the word I use. I did not say undefeated. We went defeated two years in a row. We lost every game that we played for two years in a row. I was the tallest guy on our basketball team, right? I know I know, y'all think we breed them, you know, like, like big, big and tall down in, in Delta C7 in Deering, Missouri. But, no, I was the biggest boy on the team. And in high school, I weighed about a buck 30, okay? Um, so I just got pushed around and fouled a lot and um, dunked on a whole lot. I fouled out of a lot of games just trying to, to just, I don't know, just try to have some sort of dignity when I lost again walking off of the court. And, um, and I could blame it on a lot of things. But, but you know what I blame it on? I blame it on the music. Right, y'all know certain music. Y'all, if I played the music, y'all could introduce Michael Jordan, right, because you know what music I'm talking about. And, and, and this is, you know, I graduated high school in 07, so we had pretty hype music. We had music that everybody wanted to listen to. And, uh, but I grew up in a, it was a public school but real conservative, and so we couldn't play all the, that stuff, you know what I mean? And so everybody else is running out like to T-Pain and Lil Wayne and everybody's hype, okay? And they're, they're getting after it. Not us. We ran out to Pat Benatar. <laughs> the 80s hit of her singing, hit me with your best shot. <laughs> best part is Coach Yarbrough would karaoke it, okay? And as we were running out... <laughs> He would karaoke over the top and say, shoot your best shot. Uh, and no dignity in that at all, right? And so we went defeated two years in a row, and I blame it all on the music because the music matters. And I want to preach to you tonight a message called The Music Matters. And I want to show you a point in Jesus' life. It's actually part of this week, Matthew Chapter 26, verse 26. We'll read that if you, if you have your Bibles. If not, we'll have it on the screen so you can read along with us. But there's a point in this story. It's right before Jesus goes to Gethsemane to be put on trial, to be scourged, to be crucified. And there's a part, a line in this that you most likely have le- read at some point in life but maybe not given tons of attention to because I haven't until recent years. Here's what it says in Matthew 26. It's the Lord's Supper. They were eating. As they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of this vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. I want you to see verse 30. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives because the music matters. The music matters. At first glance, I have to think, if you've been in church for a long time, maybe this could warm your heart because you think Jesus had a hymnal book too, just like the church I grew up in, and he could turn to page 73 and sing Blessed Assurance and page you know, 105 and sing Some Glad Morning, I'll Fly. He, right, uh, unfortunately, none of the archaeologists have found a hymnal in all of their digs, so we have to scratch that fantasy. But I want you to speculate with me for a moment. He sang a hymn and went out. I wonder what he sang. Because the music matters. Think of the pivotal role that music plays in your life. From from the the music running out onto the basketball court to the, the song we would pick before we would go into the batter's box, the nostalgia, right, to the music from high school, from your prom, the songs that take you back to your youth, right? I can put on salt and pepper and my mama will lose her mind because it takes her back to a certain spot. 
in life. <laughs> the wedding song you dance to. The music they played at a loved one's funeral. Songs matter. The music matters to us. Uh, this week I, I turned on an old an old Christian album by Sonic Flood, who some people in the room probably won't know who it is, but but like 2003 Cry Holy album, I listened to it this week. And I do that periodically. Every few months I'll put that album on because when I was really having a heart moment and God was changing my life, that was the album that I kept on repeat. Right? It's depending on what decade or what, what genre was played in church in the season that you got saved, most likely that's what your ear is bent towards and what you would like to hear in church because it, it means something to us but also takes us back to a time and to a place because the music matters. And because the music matters, I can't help but believe that Jesus was very selective as to what lyrics left his lips in his last moments. I wonder, it says they sang a hymn and went out. Did his voice break as he sang the song? Did, did the disciples feel the heaviness of the spirit in that upper room as he sang this song? I wonder if heaven stopped for a moment and the choir said, be quiet. And they grew silent to hear the Lord's voice as he sang the song. You see, I, I wonder, but what if I told you this? What if I could show you the song that he sang? Because Jesus actually would have sang six songs on the night of his betrayal. In our Bible, you, you have all six of those songs, all the lyrics he sang that last night of the Lord's Supper before his betrayal. You have all six of those songs in Scripture. It's Psalm 113 through Psalm 118. Those are the six songs that Jesus sang the night of his betrayal. They are actually called the Hallel. If you, if you were to literally translate them from the original language, it means the praise. And so today, if you were in it to this day, right now, 2022, if you were in an Orthodox Jewish setting, you would still hear all six psalms sung on many of the Jewish holidays, the first of the holy days in the Passover. So what happens is from all of those years ago to now, the Jewish people, when they gather on a Jewish holiday, still sing those six songs. They still sing the Hallel. And so the, the Passover meal for Jesus and his men would have lasted for several hours as it still does today. It, it's probable that Jesus and his disciples were in their private rooms until midnight. At that point, they would sing the last of the Hallel Psalms to wrap up this memorable meal, and then they would head to their camping site at the Mount of Olives. There was an oil press there, thus called Gethsemane, and it provided a quiet place for Jesus to get away to and pray. Judas, all, everybody knew where this place was. It was a memorable night, to say the least. You see Jesus on this night. He washed the feet of his disciples shocking them into silence. They didn't know how to handle that moment because they weren't used to it. And once they got quiet and were listening, he explained to them again, I'm going to give my life for you. They would all take part in the most symbolic meal in Jewish life, the Last Supper. And, and, but then what would happen is as they sat around that table, Jesus would reinterpret it as a meal that symbolized his own life. Somewhere in the mix of that, Judas would slip away into the darkness. Perhaps while all the other disciples were protesting that they wouldn't betray him, although they all would betray him in a matter of hours. And from this moment, Jesus was arrested in the garden. He was beaten savagely. He was illegally tried. He was stripped of his skin via a scourging, and then he was crucified. And the turn of events on this night was so shocking that the disciples who survived that night would never get over it. The scene was so gruesome, it appeared that demonic forces had carried that day. And yet, they had just pronounced that God was in complete control as they sang the last psalm of the Hillel Collection. And so because we know the six songs that he sang, we know the order that he would have sang them in. And literally as Jesus would leave 
that Last Supper and go to the the Garden of Gethsemane and then on to trial and on to beating and on to crucifixion, he would have sang. When it says they sang a hymn and went out, he would have sang Psalm 118 on his way out the door. And so um, most of you more than likely will know the words or some of the words that he sang as he walked out of that room and went to the Mount of Olives. I can't read all of Psalm 1-8 to you for time's sake, but let me read this to you. Literally, as Jesus left to be crucified, he sang these words from Psalm 118. The stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it's wonderful to see. Then he would sing verse 24 of Psalm 18, before, right before his crucifixion. He would say, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Now, now, isn't that the same song we sang growing up in my church? <laughs> this is the day, this is the day that the Lord hath made. That the, I will rejoice and be glad. Right, leave the singing to my brother, I know. Um, right? Now, he didn't sing it to that rhythm or that tune, but it's literally, it's, the, it's, it's, it's almost as if it's a happy song, right? It's, this is the day the Lord's made. I'm going to rejoice and I'm going to be glad in it, even though, even though the day didn't seem to go the way they were singing. They still sang the song, and here's the reminder, the music matters. You see, in all that would seem to go wrong, they were literally proclaiming that God planned all of this and it's actually going right. That, that this is the day. There was never another day in history like it. There had never been a day like it before. This is the day. It was, it was a song. In the song they said, this, this is the Lord's doing. You see, he even sang about that day at hand as if it was going to be a great day, not a horrible one. He sang about it as if he knew that one day that, that would, we would consider it a marvelous day, that maybe one day they would call this a good Friday. Not a, not a dark Friday, not a, not a bad Friday, not a, not a funeral Friday. He, he sang about that Friday as if one day it would mean a good thing for some people. You see, and I want to show you a few things that we can learn from Jesus in this moment. Number one, what I love is this, that we learned that Jesus did not let his circumstance affect his faith. You see, he is God. He is omniscient. He, he knows that, uh, you know what omniscient means, all right? He's all-knowing. Can I tell you a funny story? When I was first pastor down in the Boot Hill in Carothersville, uh, there's those three, like, real theological names, omniscient, omnipotent, right? And when I was saying them one day, Pastor, I was preaching, I was, you know, just shouting, because if you don't know what you're going to say, just say it real loud, and everybody gets energetic behind you. And so I was just hooting and hollering, and I said, he's omniscient. And I went to say, I'm omnipotent, and I said, he's omnipotent. And uh, like he's the everlasting smell, you know, or something. I don't know, but... <laughs> He's omniscient. He's all-knowing. He is, he is God. He, and because he's omniscient and he's all-knowing, he knows what's about to unfold when he leaves that Passover meal. He knows when he walks out of that room that he's on the verge of torture and betrayal. He knows it all, but still he chose to sing. This is the day. The Lord has made it. I, I, I will rejoice. I'll be glad. He did not let the impending battle in front of him rob him of his faith in that moment. You see, he knew, I'm about to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with hell on earth, and I'm going to look hell in the eye, and he's still saying, the Lord is good, and his mercy endures forever. He's walking into midnight. He's walking into a dark night of the soul. He's about to suffer for our cause. And instead of blaming or complaining about the battle in front of him, he reminded himself of the faithfulness and goodness of the eternal nature of his Father. You see, he's teaching us. You're probably never going to go through what Jesus went through. I know you're not because he wouldn't have went through it if you were going to have to go through it. You're never going to go through a, a crucifixion. You're never going to go through the scourging of nine tails, but you will go through stuff. 
You will have your own midnight. You will have your own dark night of the soul. You'll have to meet God at a dead end at some point in life. And he was teaching us that in our dark night of the soul, in our midnight, and in our dead end moments, that we cannot let those circumstances dictate our faith. I remember there was a lady growing up in our church. Some of you heard me talk about her. Her name was Sherry. And Sherry had multiple sclerosis, and from the time that I can remember her, so from the time of being a little boy, she passed away 2014, but from the time of, of growing up and being a little boy, she was confined to a wheelchair. She couldn't take care of herself. The only thing that she could do, she could talk, and as she sat in that wheelchair, she could control her hand from the wrist down, right? And I can't tell you how many services I sat in sit in, a, in, a, in, a, in an aisle like this and she we had a chair removed and she would sit in her wheelchair in the same spot every Sunday and I would look over during worship and the only thing she could do was lift her hand off the end of that chair and, and I can't and she would get up and she would sing in special songs and I and I remember I was thinking about it this week I remember one time when Sherry got up and she would sing the lines to that old song blessed assurance and she would say this is my story this is my song praising my Savior, all the, and it's, it's this picture that your circumstances don't have to dictate your faith, right? And, and I remember being convicted as a young man because I was, I was so caught up in stuff and so caught up in image and so prideful, and I thought, I don't want people to judge my worship, and so I would sit with hands in pocket, and I would, I would keep my voice low, and I would look across the aisle to a woman who gave everything she could, and it was only this. And I want to tell you this morning and tonight, no matter what moment you're in, no matter what midnight you may be in. Maybe you're not in the midnight. Maybe you're not in the valley. Maybe you're on the mountaintop. It doesn't matter where you're at, what season you're in. Your circumstances should never dictate your faith. They should never control your worship, right? And so, so Jesus would teach us that your circumstances don't dictate your faith. And from that moment, he would go to the Garden of Gethsemane. And what's, when he got to Gethsemane, you guys know this story, he would try to get comfort from his friends. And so he would say, watch and pray. And his best friends wouldn't stay awake in that moment. Three times, watch and pray. Three times, watch and could you not? Could you not tarry one hour is what he would say to his, to his disciples. And then he would say, don't worry about it, my betrayer is at hand. And he tried to find comfort, yet they couldn't even stay awake and pray with him. And it was history's most significant moment, and they couldn't keep their eyes open. Now, I, I had time. I would say some things there, but I don't. But I'll tell you this. What Jesus teaches us in that moment is Jesus did not let others' apathy steal his peace. The music matters. And part of what he sang in Psalm 118 was this. When he sang that psalm, when he sang Psalm 118 in the Hillel, right before he would walk out into that garden and his friends wouldn't stay awake, this is what he sang. He said, it is better to take refuge in the Lord than it is to trust in people. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than it is to trust in princes. And so what was he doing? He was reminding himself, I know they're not going to keep their word. They've never been through anything like this before. They have no clue the pressure that's about to to be put on them, so I'm going to walk through this by myself. And so he would remind his spirit that I'm going to take refuge in the Lord, not people, because Jesus knew where his help came from. And I, let me remind you, it's not profound, but it's still true. People will fail you, but God never will. And, and so, but you have to balance yourself. Do not let that become an excuse to live your life in isolation. All right? People will fail me, so I just won't deal with people. No, that's not the way we work. Because even God works in three parts, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, because we're all made for a relationship. But you have to remind yourself that Jesus is the only friend that will sit closer than a brother. And so Jesus would teach us. He would teach us to not let others' apathy steal our peace. And here's the thing. Number three, I'll teach you this. Jesus did not let his agony steal his praise. Think of that moment. 
He's 33 and a half years old. He's done nothing but love people. He's done nothing but his father's business. He's done nothing but signs and wonders and miracles. He's done nothing but, but, but be perfect. He's never had a cross word that was out of line. He's never, he's never done anything that was ill will. He has no sin in his life, but he still knows the outcome. He's getting ready to leave that room and walk into his darkest moment but he won't let the agony of that moment steal his peace because when Jesus was surrounded by difficulty, even death, he walked into that moment singing. And here's what he's saying. In verse 13, it says, Jesus, so, so I need you to, before we read this words, I need you to just put yourself in this moment. He's getting ready to go to the Garden of Gethsemane. Judas is going to kiss him, going to betray him. He's going to be put on trial. He's going to be beat beyond the recognition of a man. He's going to be crucified. The father's going to turn his back on. All of that's about to happen. And he's saying these lines right before that moment. My enemies did their best to kill me, but the Lord rescued me. The Lord is my strength. <laughs> And my song, he has given me victory. Songs of joy and victory are sung in the camp of the godly. The strong right arm of the Lord has done glorious things. The strong right arm of the Lord has raised in triumph. The strong right arm of the Lord has done glorious things. And then he says, I will not die. Instead, I will live to tell what the Lord has done. Then he says, the Lord has punished me. But he did not let me die, and he knows. He knows I'm going to be killed, but I'm not going to stay there. And he did not let the agony of what he was going to go through steal the peace and his, steal his praise, you see. And then the last thing, the last thing that left Jesus' lips before he went into the Garden of Gethsemane was this. Verse 28 and 29 of Psalm 118. You are my God and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his faithful love endures forever. I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to take on the sin of the world. I'm going to do it. I, this is going to be the darkest moment in all of history. You are my God. I will praise you. You are my God, I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, he's good. And his faithful love, he's reminding himself that even though he's about to face hell on earth, there's a supernatural song that can rise from within him and bring peace like no other. And I don't know what situation you're facing. I don't know what circumstance you're going through. I don't know what dark night of the soul or midnight moment that you may find yourself in now or sometime in the future. But I want to tell you this. Please, please, please never let the agony of what you're going through steal the praise off of your lips. Still, Please never let the agony of what you're facing still worship because it doesn't matter what you go through. He is always deserving. You know, we... I was thinking today about one of the songs that have carried me in a season of my life. We lost, we, we dedicated a baby tonight, but we lost a son. 19, 20 months ago, we lost a son. And I'll never forget the day we were, we were driving down the road in Jackson. My wife will probably remember this. We, we were driving down the road. I think we were going to get the kids ice cream or take them to the park or something. And the song, The Goodness of God, comes on, on the, in, the, in, the, in the car. And, and, and some of the lines of that song, you've led me through the fire. In the darkest night, you're close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God. All my life, you have been faithful. All my life, you have been so good. And with every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. And that song came on. And I'm literally walking through the darkest moment of my life. My wife and I are enduring the darkest moment of my life. And my wife sitting next to me. My two daughters are sitting in the back. And I'm trying to keep contained. Because my daughters can't understand what's happening in that moment. 
and tears are just, and I, I won't even, I won't look, I won't take my eyes off the road, and tears are falling. My wife grabs my hand, and all I can think of is I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And that song, it, you see, it became a declaration in the middle of agony that not even my darkest hour, it was, it was this prophecy coming out of my spirit that not even my darkest hour is going to make me turn my back on you. And in Jesus' darkest hour, he sang. He sang from beginning to end. He knew this was the plan. And he had anchored himself in Alpha and he had anchored himself in Omega. Revelations chapter 21 says, Then he who sat at the th on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and I am the Omega. I am the beginning and I am the end. Alpha is the first letter in the Greek alphabet. Omega is the last letter in the Greek alphabet. So it's literally like he's saying, I'm the A and I'm the Z. I'm the Alpha, I'm the Omega. I'm the beginning, I'm the end. And Jesus knew the beginning and the end of the entire story. Literally, the first recorded words we have of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke is this. He told his mother, didn't you know I would be about my father's business? As a, as a young boy at 12 years of age, he knew I've got to be about my father's business. And here he is on the eve of his crucifixion reminding himself, I still have to be about my father's business. You see, from his youth to his final days, he knew where he started and he knew where he had to end. I want to show you a picture real quick, and I want you to read that with me. Actually, just read it and see if you can figure it out. Can you do it? <laughs> According to a research at Cambridge University, it doesn't matter in what order the letters and a word are. The only important thing is that the first and the last letter be at the right place. The rest can be a total mess, and you can still read it without problem. This is because the human mind does not read every letter by itself, but the word as a whole. You see, the rest can be a total mess, and you can still read it without problem if the first letter and the last letter is where it's supposed to be. You can figure out the middle. And you see, why I think the mind works that way because it's the DNA of the character of God on the inside of his children that he knows I'm the beginning and I'm the end and if you will let me be the beginning and the end I can trust listen Listen to me, friend. I don't know what's going on in, in your situation, but if you know the first letter and you know the last letter, if you know Alpha and if you know Omega, God can make the crooked way straight and he can make sense out of everything. If you've got Alpha and you've got Omega, if you've got, if you've got A right and you've got Z right, then you're going to make it. You see, Jesus... On the night he was betrayed, put on trial, beat, and crucified, was able to endure it all because of where he had anchored his trust. On the eve of his death, Tim, if you'll come help me. On the eve of his death, he sang these words. My enemy did their best to kill me, but the Lord rescued me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He's given me victory. Songs of joy and victory are sung in the camp of the godly, the strong Right of the Lord has done glorious things. He has raised in triumph. The strong right arm of the Lord has done glorious things. I will not die. Instead, I will live to tell what the Lord has done. He's punished me severely, but he did not let me die. And then he would sing this, open for me the gates where the righteous enter, and I will go in and I will thank the Lord. These gates lead to the presence of the Lord and the godly enter there. I thank you for answering my prayers, giving me victory. The stone that the builders rejected is now becoming the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is wonderful to see. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. He's Alpha. 
He is Omega. He is A. He is Z. He is beginning. He is in. And can I tell you this, if he's the beginning and if he's the end, he can handle everything in the middle. If you got the first letter right and you got the last letter right, you can figure out all that stuff in the middle. You see, the king of kings stands at both ends of your life, at both ends of your situation, at both ends of your midnight, and he makes sense of all the chaos in the middle. He, he has a tether anchored at both ends. He's in control. And I want to tell you today, no matter what you're facing, place your anchor in Alpha. Place your anchor in Omega. Place your anchor in the one who knows the beginning and the one who controls the end. And he'll make the crooked way straight. He'll make sense out of the chaos. He'll bring peace in the middle of every storm. You, you see, on his worst day, Jesus sang a hymn and he went out. I want you to stand all across the room with me. And tonight, you may have came in here dragging. You may have came in here bitter. You may have come in here tired. But in the face of it all, you can put your anchor down and you can sing your way through because the music matters. And just like on the eve of the crucifixion, all those years ago, they sang a hymn and went out. Tonight, I want to sing a hymn and I want to go out. I want to take a moment when we put our anchor down. Tonight, I feel this prophetically in my spirit, tonight is pivotal for somebody in the room. You have to throw the anchor. You have to, you have to tether yourself. You have to anchor in Alpha, and you have to anchor in Omega. Why? Because there's storms coming, and if you're not anchored, if you're not anchored, that storm is going to tip you over. But if you will anchor yourself tonight, I guarantee you, you will look back on this eve and you will see that night I learned that I can trust God in the middle of all of that stuff. I got A and I got Z. I got Alpha and I got Omega. And the middle is going to be okay. And so tonight, tonight, you see, all of heaven is a worship service. If you don't like worship, you're not going to like heaven very much. Because all of heaven is a worship service. And tonight, just like they sang a hymn and went out, I want to end tonight. I want to wrap this, this message up by singing a hymn and going out. And I want you to do me a favor. I, I, I don't know how else to say this. I want you to worship like Sherry. You say you want me to sit and just raise my hand? No, I want you to worship with everything that you can. Right, because what she could do was this. What can you do? How can you worship? How can you honor God in this moment? How can you let loose in this moment? It's a second Sunday. It's time for, we can go a little bit deeper. And you, Well, they may judge me. Let them judge you. They don't know what you've walked through. They don't know what God's delivered you through. They don't know what he's pulled you out of. So don't worry about what they think. Worry about what he thinks. Come on, let's sing a hymn and let's go out.
Come on, give God your best tonight. Come on, worship him like he'll never let you down. Worship him like he'll never let you down. First hymn of the Hallel is Psalm 113. Psalm 113 would be the first song that Jesus sang on that night. And he would sing from the rising of the sun to the setting of the same. I will worship you. I will praise your name. And let me encourage somebody in the room for the skeptic tonight. For those who may be a little analytical tonight, you're looking at it saying they're just, a, they're emotional. You're right. I'm emotional because when God saved me, he saved all of me and he saved my emotions too. But this is not just hype and this is not just emotion. This is a moment where we breathe deep. Right, there's these, there's these weird guys called deep divers and they try to dive as deep into the ocean they can without any oxygen tanks. I watched a documentary one time and they try to dive as deep into the ocean as they can. Multiple feet deep, dozens of feet deep with no oxygen tank. And what they do is they stand on the boat for an hour before and they just <gasps> and they let it out and then they do it and they breathe deep and they're trying to expand their lung capacity because they know when we get to the deepest part that we can that we can that we can handle all the pressure and, and, all, and all the darkness and all the stuff we're going to deal with, it's going to try to take the breath out of us. And so I have to expand. I have to expand up here so when I get down there, I got enough in me to make it through. So I need you to hear me. This is not just a hype moment. This is a breathing deep moment. That way, when you get out there and when life hits you and when situations arise and when doctor's ports come, you got enough in you that when the darkness squeezes you, it doesn't take you out. You go and throw anchors in this moment. So Father, right now, we're throwing anchors. We're throwing anchors in Alpha and we're throwing anchors in Omega. We're throwing anchors in Jehovah Jireh that you provide because on the day we're lacking, we're going to have to remind ourselves that you provide. We, ho we, throw, we throw an anchor in Jehovah Nisi that you're my banner of victory. That way, on the days we feel like we're losing, we remind ourselves that you are our victory. We throw our anchor in that you're a healer. We throw our anchor in that you're a helper. We throw our anchor in that, that you are good and your faithful love endures forever. We throw our anchor in Alpha and we throw our anchor in Omega. That way when the when the winds of life and the and the and the stuff comes and the storms come, it may rock us. It may shake us, but it will not tip us over because we are anchored and we know if we've got the first and the last right, you'll handle all the chaos in the middle. So tonight we're anchoring ourselves in the Lord and I pray over my family tonight that they're throwing anchors they're tethering down 
They're encouraging their spirits. In this moment, just like on the eve of his crucifixion, he sang a hymn and went out. The music matters. And we're going to remind ourselves of how good you are, how faithful you are.